Thank you all for attending. Uh, my name is Guy Bjorki, and I'm the Director of Economic Development and Base Reuse. And also with us this evening uh, in the back corner of the room is City Manager Valerie Baroni. So welcome, Valerie. Um, and I believe I saw Council Member elect Laura Nakamura enter. So, Laura, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, other council members may uh, drop by. Again, this is not a, a council meeting. This is really a community presentation of the term sheet. And uh, if you uh, are here and in need of Spanish uh, translation, uh, uh, we have that available uh, this evening. Uh, so, um, and it's in the back. Israel, could you? Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Israel. Uh, si alguien necesita traducción en español, tenemos audífonos aquí para que oigan la presentación en vivo en español. Uh, solo visiten la mesa de acá atrás uh, y ahí voy a estar. Thank you, Israel. All right. This is the first of two community presentations about Concord First Partners' proposed term sheet for the development of the former Concord Naval Weapons Station. Both of the presentation tonight uh, and the second on December 15th, so two weeks from tonight, are being recorded and will be viewed later on Concord TV or at the project's website. We will be putting out a link tomorrow morning uh, of this recording that can be found on YouTube. So if you or your friends want to review this uh, presentation or, or uh, make it available to your uh, friends and neighbors, uh, that should be uh, available. The purpose of this term sheet presentation is to give Concord residents and interested regional stakeholders information about what is included in the document so you can understand it and express your opinions about it to the City Council when they consider accepting it at a special meeting on Saturday, January 7th, starting at 9 a.m. here in the Senior Center. So there will be another community presentation two weeks from tonight here, and then the City Council will consider the term sheet at a special City Council meeting in this same room on January 7th. We have purposely set this meeting uh, for tonight. The day after the staff report and term sheet were released, so everyone has as much information as possible, as quickly as possible, over 30 days ahead of the City Council's consideration. We don't expect anyone to have read the entire document already, uh, but if you have, that's great. Either way, the presentation tonight is designed to explain the term sheet and answer any questions you may have this evening. Uh, and we will do this all again, as I said, two weeks from tonight on December 15th. We expect the presentation uh, to take roughly 45 minutes, maybe plus or minus, and we will take questions at the end afterwards. Uh, in order to make sure that your questions are heard, please raise your hand when we get to the question and answer period and we'll bring you a microphone because while the room is mic'd up, it doesn't catch the questions well and so we will bring you a microphone so you can ask your question and we will uh, make sure that it's on the record and in the video. Before the Concord First Partners team walks you through the term sheet and the proposed project, I wanna provide a little background history and context regarding the reuse project, the current master developer selection, the purpose of the term sheet, and the expected next steps going forward should the council accept the term sheet. A little bit of the history, and I apologize because there's a lot of potential rabbit holes we can go down, so this is gonna be a brief version of the history. But in 2006, Congress passed the Base Realignment and Closure Act, which closed uh, Concord Naval Weapons Station and made it surplus to the Navy's needs. Concord, because the portion of the base that was being uh, closed and uh, redeveloped was within the city limits of Concord, 
we became the local reuse authority and in charge of the planning for the redevelopment of the base. After numerous community meetings in 2008 and 2009, in 2010, the city council adopted the reuse plan with a full environmental impact report for the roughly 5,000 acres to be planned for transfer to the local reuse authority from the Navy. MOTCO, which is the uh, terminal or port portion of the base out uh, along the, the, uh, the slough, was given to the United States Army and that's why it's now called Military Ocean Terminal Concord, and it's not part of this project. Also, the Navy housing along Olivera Road across from Willow Pass Park was given to the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard, over a period of years, decided it didn't want the property and sold it to some private developers, and that's not part of this project either. During the time frame that the city began planning those parts of the project that we are redeveloping, it became clear that there would be three different types of transfers. A 75 acre public uh, benefit conveyance, which means uh, for zero dollars, to Contra Costa County for the area north of Highway 4, the old admin area portion of the base and the county is in the process of planning what they want to do with that. But that will be going to the county at some point in the future. The second public benefit conveyance has already gone to the East Bay Regional Park District, and that too was a zero dollar conveyance. And the park district is creating plans for a regional park, as well as a conservation area for the endangered species that need to be protected as part of our development program. The third conveyance is what's called an economic development conveyance. And that's the conveyance the Navy is negotiating with the city. And the difference there is we have to fill out and, and write an essay explaining how we're gonna replace jobs with the land that they're going to convey. And we have to negotiate how much the project will be giving to the US Navy, paying the US Navy for the property as it comes to the city. So the Navy and the city are negotiating that transfer, and then as part of the term sheet and the rest of this process, we will be negotiating how the property then transfers to the master developer and future vertical developers. In 2012, the city adopted the reuse area plan to stick that area plan or the reuse plan into our general plan and give it the force of California law. To assist with the negotiation of price and terms of payment with the Navy the e on the EDC conveyance, it was decided to seek a master developer partner for the project so that we could have some way of, of making sure that the financial component of the project made sense and that the Navy felt comfortable with the agreement we intend to reach with them. Between 2014 and 2016, the local reuse authority went through an extensive master developer selection process, ultimately selecting Lennar Concord LLC and accepting their term sheet for the first phase of the project. From 2017 to late 2019, Lennar held community meetings and worked on the specific plan, environmental impact report, and other entitlement documents until a dispute about the amount of union labor to be required on the project led Lennar to let their agreement with the LRA expire in March of 2020. For the balance of 2020, the LRA staff and consultants discussed the future of the project with the development community, regional stakeholders, and Concord residents, and recommended that the local reuse authority seek a new master developer in a streamlined process. The city council agreed uh, to a new request for qualifications process 
and the request for qualification was issued in April of 2021 with the deadline for responses in June of 2021. The City Council interviewed the three master developer candidates in August of 2021 and selected the Concord First Partner team to negotiate an exclusive agreement to negotiate. In October of 2021, the City Council agreed to enter into an exclusive agreement to negotiate with Concord First Partners, setting deadlines for the negotiation of the term sheet and future steps should the term sheet be accepted by the City Council. In May of 2022, the City Council extended the term sheet stage of the ENA to January 31st, 2023. LRA staff, and Concord First Partners have worked on and now agree upon a term sheet that we are presenting tonight and will ask the City Council to accept on January 7th. A term sheet is a preliminary agreement on how the project's details should be included in the future specific plan and property transfer and development rights in a disposition and development agreement between the LRA and Concord First Partners. The term sheet does not commit the city to proceed with disposition or development of the Concord Naval Weapons Station property, but when combined with the terms of the exclusive agreement to negotiate, it does impose obligations on both parties to work collaboratively and in good faith to reach agreement on the entitlement documents consistent with the term sheet. The Concord First Partners term sheet is based on a conceptual land use plan with estimated residential and commercial densities. You'll see in the term sheet and in the staff report, but in the term sheet, exhibit A to the term sheet shows that land use plan and a table of densities and uses, and that will be also explained to you tonight by Concord First Partners. The conceptual land use plan also serves as the basis for a conceptual financial feasibility model that has been reviewed by the LRA's financial consultants and found to be based on reasonable assumptions. That too is in the term sheet. That summary is found in exhibit B. The next steps in the process, should the city council accept the Concord First Partners term sheet in January, a series of next steps will start with the goal of bringing them all back before the City Council for consideration within the next 24 months. Those efforts include, and it's a list of them here, as outlined in the staff report, a writing a specific plan to establish zoning and design standards for the process. Sorry, I'm not keeping up with the PowerPoint. analyzing the impacts and required mitigations of the draft specific plan in the environmental impact report, amending the area plan to ensure consistency between the specific plan and the general plan, negotiating both a disposition and development agreement and a development agreement between the LRA and Concord First Partners, and reaching agreement with the United States Navy on the terms of the Economic Development Agreement, Conveyance Agreement, for property transfer. I know that's a lot. It's a complicated project. Uh, and when we get to q and I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have about what I've presented to you so far. Now I'd like to turn this over to Jeb Elmore of Concord First Partners to walk you through the term sheet and have them introduce their team to describe the project. Thank you. Thank you, Guy, and good evening, and thank you for being here tonight. My name is Jeb Elmore of Concord First Partners. I'll introduce my, my neighbor here shortly. Um, we're very pleased to be here tonight to present the term sheet, which we'll try to condense into a summary for this crowd, and again, are happy to receive questions and repeat this, as Guy alluded to, on the 15th of December, as you have more time to review the term sheet that was presented yesterday. To refresh everyone's memory, we've been spending a few community outreach meetings to really focus upon our, the nature of our partnership and the companies that form it, but for a quick recap, 
Uh, the three partners that make up Concord First Partners are the Lewis Management Corporation, the company I directly work for, Discovery Builders, and the California Capital Investment Group. Uh, we have a demonstrated record of accomplishments leading, led off by the fact that we're privately held, which really means that we're not beholden to stock market, not beholden to stockholders. We make our own decisions and could proceed forth with sound business decisions to keep this project moving forward. We have over 176 combined years of experience in the development industry and have unmatched financial strength, which will be necessary to implement this project for certain. We have delivered over 120,000 homes collectively as a partnership and over 50 million square feet of non-residential space. So the wealth of our experience and multifaceted experience in that will help us deliver a balanced mixed use project that is proposed today. We are also locally owned very important uh, to the community and will be a theme throughout this presentation tonight. One of our partners with headquarters right here in Concord, but all three partners are headquartered in Northern California. And also our partnership has tremendous base reuse experience for similar facets, and that's highlighted by the Oakland Army Base, the Marsh Air Force Base in Southern California, as well as the Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento. And now I'd like to offer a preview of the term sheet and I'll try to condense it down to sectional references based upon the feedback we've received to date of what we believe we've heard is most important to the community. And I'd like to start off by referencing the labor policies and our commitment for local hiring initiatives in the project. We have secured and agreed upon a project labor agreement with the Contra Costa Building and Construction Trades, which we're very pleased to have, and we'll need the great partners and workforce to build this project and all the great infrastructure and buildings and homes that will be involved and certainly support the payment of fair wages and benefits across the board. In addition, we'll be certainly supporting the Concord First Initiative, which embeds a commitment for a 40% higher local program. So we'll be seeking to promote as much employment directly from Concord as possible to continue that success and opportunity for the city of Concord and the residents and workers herein. In addition, we're seeking and looking forward to working with our trade partners to establish apprenticeship programming, job training, and job fairs to, again, further encourage local residents to work on the project. Another highlighted attribute is certainly the affordable housing component of the project. We are respecting the 25% affordable housing obligations, all subject to an 80% or less area median income, as embedded in policy documents today. And the affordable housing programming for the site is really made up of the following five bullets, six bullets, excuse me, which I'll review in a little more detail in the consecutive slides. The legally binding agreements that pre-existed us, the resolution in, from 2012, also pre-existing, the application of junior accessory dwelling units to fulfill affordable housing programming and offer more variable, uh, variable, variety and options, and of course the orderly balanced delivery of these affordable housing throughout the project, and of course, introducing Related California as our affordable partner to help promote and implement this robust affordable housing program. Wanted to review quickly the legally binding agreements, uh, the legally binding agreements that exist today. Uh, there's an existing collaboration that's a group of nonprofit affordable housing developers that have their commitments established to produce homeless housing which we will produce 16 acres and deliver those in pad form. And really the delivery is ranging from 130 to 260 units, but no less than 1% of the overall unit count for the project. And those also will be evenly distributed throughout the project. In addition, there'll be a 10 acre set aside for a food bank facility. And the food bank facility will serve very important service and needs to support feeding not only the population that occupies these affordable residents, but also throughout the city of Concord and even the region. We'll also be incorporating self-help housing, so an ownership housing stock um, on about two acres, uh, again, for about 20 plus or minus units. We'll have that programming in the future. And in addition, in the initial phase of development, we'll be providing a four-acre site for a veterans hall. Uh, obviously, the veteran housing will come in addition on other affordable housing sites as it will be prioritized accordingly, but that four acres specific for the veterans hall. 
and uh, obviously we'll be pursuing collectively with the city any public funding opportunities to produce that any veterans housing that also exists throughout the project. To highlight also some additional measures as I identified, resolution 2012, which really codifies the 25% affordable housing obligations and calls out a minimum of 3,020 affordable units with the preference that those units be dispersed throughout the site as well as placed in standalone projects. Uh, so we've obviously will embed those sites within our specific plan process. In addition to those 3,000 units, again, as I mentioned, we have proposed 879 junior accessory dwelling units. And what these are are really almost similar to one bedroom studio apartments that will be part and attached to market rate residential, again, to offer more variety for affordable housing seekers. And um, also those will be also held to the 80% or below median income standards. Uh, in addition, uh, the requirement that we have as the master developer is to deliver pads, build ready pads with all the public infrastructure necessary to service access and, and wet utilities and dry utilities to the properties. And we wanted to offer the fact that the infrastructure components to serve the affordable housing is right about at a cost of $187 million that we're not seeking to recapture or be reimbursed for. In addition, we have gone above and beyond to s provide some project contributions towards affordable housing of $50 million, which will also be dispersed evenly throughout the project to help seed affordable housing. And obviously the siting of affordable housing will really come through the specific plan process uh, where we actually locate specific sites and show that dispersion throughout the community. Next, I'd like to introduce the concept of including our partner, Related California. Now, I could do an entire presentation here tonight on Related because they are really so wonderful and great at what they do. And we see them as the leader in the industry, but we'll keep the focus to the term sheet now. So offering a few light facts, they've delivered over 18,000 affordable units in California and have been doing such since 1989. Uh, their projects are really indistinguishable from market rate to affordable. We're always astounded by the architectural qualities that they deliver and they intend to deliver that here today as well today in this project, I should say. And the roles that we see related serving are a bit multifaceted. We see related serving as an administrator to help us with site selection, to help identify sites that'll produce the best opportunity for public fund programming, and as well as work with the city on competitive bidding processes to select nonprofit developers, other in addition to related, for either in partnership with related or for isolated standalone projects. And we've broken down the general ratios that we're seeking to produce with related and the nonprofit partners that I won't recite because it's on the table there. But obviously, we definitely want opportunity for all, which is why we're reserving a significant amount of units for just nonprofit partners. Another focus of the community is certainly is the environment and the open space. I want to first caveat that these are conceptual. We've not done any survey uh, or any boundary calculations to this date, but we've provided some fairly exact numbers because we didn't want to offer up too much of a round number. Um, so the public benefit conveyance that Mr. Or Guy alluded to earlier of over 2,500 acres has been already secured and given to the East Bay Regional Parks District. So that's the good news. But within the EDC, the Economic Development Conveyance portion, or the Development Project portion, better stated, there's additional open space parks and recreation set-asides, which I'll run through briefly. Parks and open space of about 386 acres. Recreation, which is including the Tournament Sports Park and the City Regional Park that's adjacent to it of 174 acres. The Neighborhood Frame, or the Green Frame Park, um, which is 82 acres. We've the change from the area plan is now we've in introduced 35 acres of on-site habitat creation within the EDC boundaries. And the Mount Diablo Creek restoration of 179 acres, all for a nice round number of 3,395 acres that will be dedicated in open space recreation programs, which is less than a 1% deviation from the area plan from 2012. In addition, we are seeking to expedite habitat mitigation, and the delivery of such with the project. Certainly, that'll come in two main forms. That's the creation on-site for habitat mitigation within the EDC and PBC portions of the site for endangered species, as well as for Mount Diablo Creek, 
the restoration project that will occur orderly and balanced with the delivery of the project, such that basically in concert with the project as it develops adjacent with the creek, we'll be developing that portion of the restoration project. We're having to effectively mitigate for the loss of potential habitat for a base, uh, which is interesting to say the least, but nonetheless, uh, we are doing such at a two to one ratio, so two to one ratio to supply back to for habitat uh, versus what the is being lost with the development of the base. And very critically, for absolute and full transparency, the city will oversee and manage all of the biological permitting and mitigation. We, of course, will offer full support and funding of that, but the city will retain full oversight control. In addition, to the tremendous community benefits that have been invoked in this project over seven years, as Guy described, of diligent community outreach by the city that preceded us to achieve the ov overarching goals of the community, inclusive of the expanse of open space, the critical housing, inclusive of affordable housing, as well as the job creation uh, to deliver really a world-class project, we have gone above and beyond to deliver the following. In the term sheet has represented contribution of $100 million towards the tournament sports park and or citywide park at the city's discretion. And included in that is a $5 million contribution in phase one of the development. So in the initial phase of development, we will have a $5 million contribution to activate some portion of the tournament sports park, hopefully. In addition to that, we are contributing $65 million towards a community center and or library. We view them as, as really one and the same offering different services in the same or similar building. And that will be developed in the campus district, which will be described momentarily, in phases two and three of the project. We are also expediting the repayment of the city's outstanding loan of approximately $15 million in the initial first and second phase of the project. In working with the East Bay Regional Parks District, we're also seeking to construct interim improvements to connect the Delta De Anza Trail at its current terminus at Willow Pass Road to the Contra Costa Canal Trail to provide a regional trail network on an interim basis. Of course, that will become a permanent trail network through the project when the rest of the project is built out. And of course, uh, not of course, but in addition, we're expediting the delivery of some commercial building square footage that we'll directly build of about 10,000 square feet. And what that is promoting is a couple things. First of all, helping to create and establish a sense of place for the community, as well as coming online with the affordable housing, as well as the food, food, um, uh, the food bank facility and the jobs that we'll be creating in phase one. And you can start sensing that there'll be immediate services for the most vulnerable portions of our population all within the base. They'll have a place to live, a place to work, and immediate access to f goods and services without the need for an automobile. I'll let my neighbor discuss the conceptual land use plan in much more detail, but I wanted to offer the relevant facts from the term sheet. The, per the, the project is anticipated to be in, developed in five phases and over a 40-year timeline. We'll be balancing our delivery of a mix of land uses uh, to continue to create a balance of land use deliveries as appropriate throughout the site. Critically important is that build out, we're proposing over 16,000 jobs. And that will equate to a job to housing ratio of over one, which is very important, such that every home that's built on the property would, in theory, there would be a job for that home within the project itself. As alluded to earlier also, we've modernized our residential programming to promote more attainability in the market rate housing. Attainability meaning affordability. We want to make sure that we widen the buyer pool and broaden the market for this project. We're also responding to market demands by increasing some densities because the market demand today is telling us that buyers are seeking low maintenance, uh, low maintenance options, smaller yard spaces, and whatnot. So we really feel we're seeking to deliver what the market is currently demanding. And that comes and ends up being an increase to the residential unit count we are proposing for the site. Uh, we are proposing 15,595 total residential units inclusive of fulfilling the 25% affordable housing requirements. In addition to the land uses, we're also committing to deliver a new Willow Pass Road and bridge with the phase one of the development to help traffic circulation. I deal with that as well, leaving town and coming in. 
and of course our commitment to deliver recycled water to the project as well. I'll just touch upon this briefly. Guy obviously have explained that there will be a Navy and city land conveyance agreement, the economic development conveyance agreement. Guy did a great job reviewing that. For full, again, transparency, a common theme tonight, the city, as Guy alluded to, will oversee and manage all negotiations with the Navy. We are here to support that and support the city in that endeavor. The additional facts of the conveyance agreement that are important are the fact that it will also ensure the Navy's remediation of the site and ensure the timely remediation of that site such that we can avoid any project delays which would really impact our ability to proceed forth. And of course, in addition, the city to Concord First Partners Conveyance Agreement uh, is, is also needing to be. Uh, this is also, as Guy alluded to, referred to as the Development and Disposition Agreement, the DDA. And the DDA will do a few things. Uh, will do many things, but, but importantly identified as part of the term sheet. It, will, it actually includes developer milestones that will keep us on task to make sure there's a timely delivery and a continuous delivery, again, as long as the project uh, maintains some level of financial feasibility, but nonetheless, specific milestones to proceed forth to keep an ongoing effort so this project can move fast and forward uh, as expeditiously as possible. It also will require us to put land in development-ready condition prior to any land transfer. What development-ready condition means is obviously the site is, the project is entitled, and we have designed and developed infrastructure plans and confirmed for the city of the financial capacity to fund that infrastructure prior to any land being conveyed to Concord First Partners. In addition, any land transfers that come will be done in a phased manner. There will be no bulk transfers of land. The term sheet calls out increments of 50 to 100 acres for each one of those subphase deliveries as we continue and progressively develop the site in an orderly fashion. In addition, as the master developer, we have made a commitment to offer, again, opportunity for all. And therefore, we've made the commitment by, state, by suggesting that we will sell 50% of the market rate housing in the project to unaffiliated third parties that are not a part of our partnership and the effect of unaffiliated, of course. And again, all of those will be prioritized for local builders first. So what we want to promote is much local building on the site, local opportunity, again, another common theme. And of course, we will be establishing a valuation process with the city to make sure that third party sales occur for a fair value. Again, here's the word transparency again. Accountability and transparency we certainly understand is a very important to this community and to the city, and hopefully we've proven ourselves through the term sheet and the negotiation process as such. As part of that accountability, we have offered and committed to open book accounting. And what that means is the city, at all times, will have direct access to our books and records, contracts, costs, revenues, and we'll be able to verify such along with annual financial reporting that we will deliver to the city. Obviously, this will allow the city to, to, to calculate some things on an additional page, or the, the successive page in a moment, but nonetheless, we are always going to be upfront and transparent and held accountable by the city. And in addition, I want to state that we're also working to work, we want to work with the city to pursue public financing programs and grant programs and if we're able to secure those with the city, we of course will be able to only enhance the community benefits that I represented earlier. Obviously, our ultimate goal in today and throughout this process is to reach a formal public-private partnership with the city of Concord. And what that means is we at a point where we have reached alignment of our mutual goals and interests to make sure that we can implement a successful project. And some fashions of how we'll do that is, first and foremost, is establishing a conceptual framework to ensure financially feasibility. It's important the project's feasible so it can be kept going and there are no delays or causes to stop and take a break. In addition, Concord First Partners has agreed to a developer internal rate of return, an IRR, or hurdle rate, of 18%, which compares to the prior developer of 20%, so we are accepting a 2% less IRR. Um, I wanted just to point out, as I mentioned during the public hearing, that an industry standard developer hurdle rate, or IRR, typically ranges from 20 to 25% based upon the level of risk that a developer would incur. 
So it's very important to point out that in the spirit of working with the city in a public-private partnership that we have accepted a below industry standard return of 18% for this project. In addition to the hurdle rate, we are also working to build a shared success program with the city of Concord such that the project achieves certain financial hurdles exceeding 18%, the city and the project will directly benefit by such. And we'll establish a community benefit fund that we're looking for the city to take the lead on, not the developer, or and or at the city's discretion uh, advisory committees to help prioritize and redirect dollars that may be received through that shared success programming back into the project, which will only further enhance community benefits and commitments the project can make. And we certainly, um, obviously, are eventually going to be forming and setting up the development and distribution agreement where all these terms and many more will be uh, codified. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Yenchek of HOK, our project planner. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeb. Thank you. All right, so, yeah, that was for you. Um, we've, we've talked, we've thrown a lot of numbers at you. We've talked a lot about metrics. There's been some acronyms and jargon, I think. You know, there's a lot of hard work, you know, that goes into making these kinds of projects, as Guy and others know. You know, at the end of the day, we have to occasionally remind ourselves, why are we doing this? The why. The what and the how we'll spend a lot of time on, but the why is we're here to create a world-class project with you. And so the next series of slides are going to walk through how we envision doing that with you and essentially taking the metrics and the numbers that are in the term sheet and translating those into graphics and maps, some early visuals to help us begin to wrap our heads around the quality of place that, these, um, that this vision would create. So let's jump into it. So ultimately, as we move from a term sheet into a specific plan, as Guy mentioned, these are ultimately grounded on pillars or first principles. And so when any time our pen hits the paper, um, we always look back to the area plan, which established a series of principles that are on the screen around equi equitable and inclusive places, that we would define this as a world-class project through healthy and well places, a lot of open space, that we would be open and create places and environments, jobs, housing for all generations, that our place here it would be universally accessible, and that we would always look towards environmentally progressive regenerative strategies in net zero. So this is how we measure at the highest level what a world-class project is. I want to immediately jump into the land use plan. What's on the screen, this, all these various colors, and I'll kind of walk through them, this begins to translate many of the uses that Jeb and Guy just talked about into a plan so we can start to envision how these various uses would come together and create places, how they would interrelate with the surrounding community, integrate with the rest of Concord, connect our community, create great parks and trails and so forth. Um, just to kind of walk through, because I'm sure that the legend's a little difficult to actually read from here. From dark purple all the way to the lightest shade of yellow towards the lower right of the plan, the density or the amount of building, the intensity of building essentially um, graduates, where the greatest amount of density is towards Port Chicago Highway, towards BART, where we have transportation access, great visibility, and then gradually reduces as we move south towards Willow Pass Road and continues to reduce as we head all the way down towards Bailey Road. It's a lot of strategy that goes into that that was actually part of the area plan. Thinking about how could we create in blue a campus district with an academic anchor that would have visibility from the highway, great access, access to BART. How could we create an innovation center, an innovation district, which is light pink, you know, up towards the north that could benefit from immediate truck access, that could help businesses drive there, that research and advanced manufacturing could find a home without causing any difficulties for the residents that are far, far away. Of course, the TOD districts around BART, the benefit from transit, their mixed use, this is where people live, it's where they work, play, there's great retail. And then we've got our neighborhoods, the darker orange being more intensive development, higher density, around 15 dwelling units per acre, and then graduating into the lower densities as we become adjacent, the adjacent single family residences. At a big scale, that's how we translate the term sheet into a plan. And now I'd like to walk through the individual phases um, to show you how this unfolds. I'm not gonna read every one of these bullet points. Don't worry, Guy, um, and everyone. We're just gonna hit on a couple of the high notes. Um, the first phase is really important. You know, how you kick off a project is critical. You've gotta come out of the, out of the gate strong. 
And so we look towards one, the parcels of land that are available that have been conveyed, and then the availability and accessibility to infrastructure which exists along Willow Pass Road, up north towards Port Chicago. And this tells us a lot about where we should begin. We can immediately um, have the access off of Willow Pass Road into residential areas, shown in orange, the pinkish area towards the North Innovation District where we can produce jobs, jobs today, jobs immediately. This is a big part of the vision is that each step we're bringing jobs and housing along. And then nearly 80 acres of parks and greenway right out of the gate, as well as the Veterans Hall that Jeb referred to in that four acre land set aside. First phase has a lot in it, a lot of benefits, and this immediately hits on a lot of the key goals that are important to us. So now we're gonna walk from phase one all the way through five, and I'll, I'll kind of speed up. I think you all are, are following pretty closely. So phase two has nearly 5,000 dwelling units. Um, there's significant jobs that are now coming online. Within the area inscribed in black in phase two is both the TOD core, which are the purplish sites on the map towards BART. This is where we can actually attract a lot of office users, as well as R&D users that really choose access to transportation and a very lively 24-7 mixed-use environment over all else. Whereas the blue campus district produces jobs through both an academic anchor that we would attract, as well as the various kinds of businesses that want to orbit around an academic institution. This creates incredible um, vibrancy um, in phase two. It also comes along with near over 80 acres now, parks and greenways, the food bank, and we're now hitting a critical mass where fire station and other kinds of civic amenities are needed. So that's phase two, on to phase three. We continue our march. Now we're moving south of phase one towards Willow Pass. Um, this is where we're really beginning to kind of complete, let's call it the northern end of the project. Additional dwelling units and jobs, again, moving lockstep. We've now hit a population where schools are necessary, 15 acres identified for schools in the lightish blue. Um, on nearly 90 acres of open space in phase three. And there's also the wetland preservation areas also the community center that Jeb referred to now. We've now got such a significant population here and the number of jobs and residents that these kinds of amenities and community benefits, which we'll talk more about, are becoming more and more important and more and more subscribed as our population grows. Phase four, we now have moved south of Willow Pass Road. Um, we're continuing our march down. And this goes about as far as West Street, if you know, off to our west. This includes, um, again, we're now moving into lower densities of residential product, which we'll show some images of here in a moment to explain what residential product means, as well as nearly 40 acres of parks. The green frame, which provides a really critical threshold or buffer between this development and the new homes and the existing that are to the south is really important. That comes along in this phase as well, same as in the area plan. And then finally, phase five. Um, as we go all the way down towards Bailey and we hit the southern tip of the site, we now complete our program that Jeb described. Nearly 100 acres of parks and greenways in this final phase. There's a lot of open space to the south. Want to make sure that the surrounding neighborhoods have access to parks as well that are right there on the edge. Um, the green frame is completed and there's now an additional fire station as well as schools that come along too. This is how we translate Jeb's um, vision and what was described here by Concord First Partners. Lockstep jobs and housing all along the way with open space and community benefits, including civic improvements like fire stations, schools, community center, veterans hall, and much more. So hopefully that's helpful in kind of translating those words into a, a visual. Now we're gonna get into some images. The plan highlights, and I won't go through each one of these, but we wanna hit on some of the key pillars within the area plan and that we've talked about with the city sense. The TOD district really needs to be absolutely vibrant it needs to deliver that through a vibrancy of use, a mix of uses, retail at the ground plane, jobs and housing above. We need to make sure that our transportation system is convenient, multimodal, you can get wherever you need to be with ease. Most everyone who chooses to bring their business here or start your business, move your family here will do so because of access to BART, that'll probably be front of mind for a lot of people. So we wanna make sure that we're connected to our transportation systems. We want to make sure that open space and sustainability is always a hallmark as we develop along the way. As we move forward, we're going, to we're going to build with you a set of goals for a specific plan. So that's what follows the term sheet. Today, as we measure our success, we take the area plan goals, which of course we inherited from all of you from before, 
regional priorities that have changed since the area plan was first cast. There's certainly more housing pressures today than ever before. We need our job space to be strong across the city, across the region. Economic development has become more and more important. Transportation, it's more difficult to move around our region, has become critically important. And of course, the environment is always there. What we do is we take the regional pressures of today, we combine them with the community's goals, and ultimately that's how we create the Concord First Partners strategies. And this will continue to evolve, and we will measure as we go forward each time our pen hits the paper and each decision we make against that. Promise some visuals, so we're now gonna get into some visuals. This one being an aerial view. Um, BART is in the foreground. You're kind of looking um, south away towards Bailey Road. Of course, there's the hills beyond. We envision a world-class project. You can see open space throughout. Hopefully, you're seeing open spaces that go from the very northern tip of the project all the way to the south. Imagine being able to ride your bike, being able to jog, go on a walk with your dog, vast distances without having to cross streets. We think there's so many um, benefits to this site and its open space network the existing creeks and the trail networks that they provide. These are the hallmarks of a world-class project. So we're now gonna kind of zoom in from the big picture aerial vision into some more detailed views, starting with open space and recreation. So, you know, Jeb and I have talked a lot about just the sheer number of acres of open space. And so I'm gonna move into the more of the qualities of those open spaces, starting with open spaces and trails. Critical to um, our plan, as we go forward, we think is connectivity. So the diagram on the left illustrates how we get from the southern tip of the project all the way from Bailey Road to BART on a continuous open space system. This green spine is a hallmark of a great place. This is something that we're quite excited about. In parallel to that, we of course have the trails along the creek, which provide you another access way, another corridor that's maybe more filled with trees, more park-like. You have multiple choices. And then east-west, we have ways in which we can connect into the surrounding community to make sure um, that our project is um, woven into the fabric of Concord. Here we've got the open space types. Um, you know, long story short, there's gonna be a variety of open spaces here. You know, from more urban parks that are highly programmed, active, vibrant, filled with farmers markets, there's children's playgrounds, a lot of vibrancy towards our more um, active areas and urban centers, especially towards BART. We're also gonna have, at the other end of the spectrum, very ecologically oriented places along our creeks, along our wetlands that are really preserved for nature. Maybe there's overlooks and some trails nearby, but actually we've got places for flora and fauna to thrive and everything in between. In addition, um, we've got some significant um, uh, community benefits, and I just wanna highlight on this just for a minute. The Tournament Sports Park, which of course was forged and born in the area plan and continues in today's vision, this is going to be a destination anchor for the entire project, as you know. Tournament Sports Parks are vibrant economic attractors. It's a reason why people choose to bring their families to one place versus another. The revenues from tournament sports are quite you know, beneficial to a city. It also really immediately underscores a community's commitment to health, wellness, youth, our next generation. Neighborhood serving retail, as Jeb mentioned, you know, this is what Concord First Partners is, I mean, excellent at, making sure that our neighborhood centers are lively, that there are places to go. Um, and then in early phases, the De Anza Trail, making sure that that connection is delivered immediately and then builds from there. This is the beginning of the community benefits. It goes on from there. Um, as Jeb mentioned, you know, a library within the campus district we think is really beneficial to the project. We think really important, underscoring educational, lifelong learning, our youth and a community center, as I described before. These kinds of community benefits ultimately are what really um, kind of enliven the project, right? They're places where we come together, you know, where we collaborate, where we share stories, where we socialize. These become community centers. I'm quite excited about them and what they can mean for the project. Um, briefly on sustainability. These sustainability strategies on this and the next slide are what we're excited about right now. Focused, of course, first and foremost on clean air, water, and land. This is an incredible property. We've got creeks to protect. We've got clean air. We want to reduce emissions. We want to be good stewards of the environment. This has been a hallmark of the city of Concord and the area plan. We are running with that. Some of the strategies we're going to be looking at is smart waste management. We're going to be looking, of course, into recycled water use, as Jeb mentioned, making sure we're reducing our potable water 
using reuse water wherever possible. Sustainable transportation solutions, making sure that our buses are electrified, that electricity is coming from clean energy. And we want to make sure that we've got a combination of photovoltaics, other ways in which we can produce electricity. Our world is electrifying you know, by the day, and we want to make sure that our project is a world-class leader in that. Um, recycled water we've already touched on. We want to make sure that we also, in our vast watersheds on the property, capture our water and reuse that in our irrigation systems and throughout the project. Additional sustainability strategies that we're thinking about, you know, all the way down to the building level. How do we make sure that our buildings are intelligent, um, that there's economic health? This is a key sustainability factor as well. We want to make sure that jobs and housing are lockstep so that our community and our economy is sustainable. We want to commune with nature, the hills, the trails, as I mentioned before. Our infrastructure needs to be resilient now more than ever. We'll be looking at fire breaks. We'll be looking at all kinds of things to ensure that the investments made today endure. And then, you know, last and, and, and maybe most important, the biological and ecological assets that are within the property um, um, must be treasured, must be protected. And the plan takes into account how we can make sure that the watersheds upstream from those assets are protected, and also that the existing trees and other things across the site um, become integrated in the open space system. Next on to equ equ equi <laughs> equity and inclusivity, pardon me. Um, so a world-class project you know, ultimately comes down to you know, the measure of who we see in the public places, ultimately who is welcomed, and we want to make sure that this is for everyone. Jobs for everyone, this is housing for everyone, and to do that, we want to promote a diverse ecosystem of businesses where you can start your business as your business scales, medium-scale businesses, and also large businesses are welcomed. We want to make sure that our neighborhoods have identity, that what we do in our public realm and in our parks, how we even build our buildings, that they're specific to Concord, our identity here. We promote diverse housing mixes, as Jeb mentioned, to drive affordability, welcome different family sizes, different income levels. And this is how we deliver on an equitable and inclusive place. And that plays through into the land uses and everything else. Multi-generation. So this is one that we've talked about a lot. We've heard from you in previous community meetings how this project represents an opportunity for all generations to come together whether you're retirees who just want to enjoy open space, long walks along the trails, biking loops, for the youth to come here and enjoy sports and tournament park. Throughout your entire walk of life, we want to make sure everyone feels welcome and included here. We do that through promoting public space of different types and scales, and we distribute it throughout so that it's always immediately accessible. Um, we make sure that there's um, opportunities for intergenerational living, in particular senior housing, and that we create affordable housing, as Jeb mentioned, throughout affordable for seniors, veterans, individuals with special needs across the entire spectrum. Our job generators, I think a lot of us tonight are excited about jobs creation, so I wanted to just you know, dig into this one a little bit. So it's a little hard to read the numbers, so I'll go through it. Um, so I'm um, just going you know, upper left and we'll go clockwise. The Innovation District, which is in phase one, produces approximately 5,000 jobs. It's about 2.2 million gross square feet this is a major economic driver right out of the gates that I know Lou and others are extremely excited about here on our team. This is a place where Concord can offer large-scale advanced manufacturing. This is where we can provide setting for research that our um, competing cities and projects right now in the pipeline simply cannot. Unmatched truck access, high visibility from the highway, we have a very high competitive advantage here. Next to that, let's go to the right, the blue diagram is um, the campus district. This is where, through attracting various anchors, including an academic institution, we can attract office and commercial users that want to be between both an academic institution or an institution for research in general and an innovation district. And we see this throughout the Bay Area and around the world. Having that proximity of being able to learn, discover, educate, create your think tank and your research, be able to build right there and test what you're building, um, that is incredible competitive advantage for Concord. We go to the lower left, the purples, the TOD district, the transit-oriented district near BART. We've talked about this, mixed use, vibrant, 24-7. And then the small little red dots there to the right that really aren't so small in the bigger scheme of things. These are our village centers. These continue to produce jobs. These are our neighborhood retail. This is where we go to get a gallon of milk. These are bodegas, cafes, and other such things. This is how we're leading early in the phases with heavy jobs, 
immediate jobs to provide jobs today for the Concord community, but we continue that throughout the life of the project. And then briefly on the housing story, so now that we've gone through jobs. So the housing comes along Mark's uh, lockstep. Um, we begin with a transit-oriented neighborhood and districts on the left, so close to BART, um, where we've got significant units, as well as with the residents that are projected that you can see there in purple. And then to the right in the lower density neighborhoods, both medium and low, um, we continue to deliver units throughout the life of the project all the way through phase five. I think the real take home here is um, while it's often um, uh, very attractive to just lead with a lot of residential in today's market, the demand is there. What Concord First Partners is bringing is a mixed use phase strategy, jobs and housing along the way with a lot of jobs up front. So let's go into placemaking, and then I promise we'll get into q and I think I'm being asked to speed up maybe a little bit. Is that what that look is? I think it is. Um, so our, um, our districts, um, very briefly, um, these are our districts. So purple, TOD, um, the orange is the innovation, blue is the campus district, and yellow is the village neighborhoods. I want to walk you through some exciting renderings. And let's just get into the visual, uh, visuals. I know, this, uh, I know this gets the whole team and everyone excited. So what you see in front of you here is a depiction of maybe you just got off of BART. You're coming home from work. It looks like it's evening. You've, um, now you're about to get on the bus, but maybe you need to get some groceries. Maybe you want to meet some friends or your family for dinner. Maybe you want to hop into a cafe real quick to grab a coffee on your way to work. You see housing. You see jobs above. You see in the center of it a public plaza, open, porous, welcoming, transparent in all edges. This is that kind of vibrancy that Jeb and, and Guy were referring to. This is the kind of density that we're projecting at the TOD core um, area. And this is the kind of density that really promotes successful transportation. So this is, this is a day in the life of at the TOD. The various um, qualities um, that we're trying to create, walkability, I'll just touch on a couple of these, market flexibility, making sure that our office footprints are flexible for different kinds of industries, different kinds of businesses, that our streets integrate bicycle transportation, bus, shuttle, that they're multimodal, and that throughout all of that, we make sure that this is distinctly undeniable Concord. It only makes sense here that it feels like our neighborhood. And we do that through material choice, through the planting choice, and so on. And we'll need your help throughout all of that. Some of the, um, some of the additional um, you know, features, there's going to be mixed use apartments in this area, mid-rise buildings. Um, we're going to focus a lot on ground floor retail to make sure that our edges are always active. Um, the Innovation District, which is in phase one, this is where we're making things making things here in Concord. This is where our businesses are, manufacturing is located, research and development, logistics. These are the kinds of um, spaces and buildings that those create. Um, our innovation centers are really important nuclei, and that's what the building could be in the middle. And then on either side, two and three story um, buildings, large floor plates that allow us to build the kinds of technologies and products that are driving our economy tomorrow. Ultimately, we think if we do that right, we're going to attract research facilities. We're going to attract um, companies that need to do small-scale production and pilot that simply cannot find a place for that in the peninsula, can't find a place for that in, you know, down in Silicon Valley. We can attract businesses here because we have the land, we have the workforce, we, um, we want the jobs, and we have the high-quality education. So those are the kinds of things that will be attracting the Innovation District. The Campus District. This maybe is a day in the life of that. What you're seeing is a building that could be either a library, potentially the academic anchor. We're seeing the kinds of office and housing that want to orbit around it. Um, we're seeing slightly higher densities than in the innovation district. This is where we attract businesses that want to have one arm in TOD and access to transit, one arm in the innovation district where we're making things. This is a place where um, ultimately discovery is made. This is where we educate our next generation. It can be quite exciting. You know, this is um, depicting a quad at the center of that campus. We're seeing a lot of people, you know, mixing in the spaces. This is what success would look like. We think that involves cultural facilities. We want to attract research labs. We're going to certainly have housing components here. Academic anchor, they're going to need housing. Employers, they're going to want housing as well nearby. Open space is really critical to the success of campuses. We think about the campuses you've been on in your life that shaped your life. Um, ultimately, you know, they're defined by their open spaces. Village centers, as we begin to move south, um, the village centers um, now become a little quieter of places than relative to the TOD core. 
These are the one to two story um, places where we can find cafes, where we can grab some lunch. It's closer to the homes that are down south, say, of Willow Pass Road towards Bailey. Very walkable, family oriented. You see bicycle paths, you see shared streets. Um, we see um, places for children to play. And this is, where the, the, this is where the project begins to kind of step down in its intensity as we move to the south. Create these kinds of environments, and we ultimately do that to create pocket parks. We do that to create a variety of housing types. Our residential product types uh, move across a gradient. We want to make sure that, um, to Jeb's point, that affordability and inclusivity is driven by the fact that we have housing for all family sizes um, and various income levels. Um, from higher density, um, single family detached product, all the way down to attached um, townhouse. Want to make sure that um, everyone is able to find a home that suits their family type and needs here. Thanks. No, it's all right. Um, and then we want to make sure that each one of those neighborhood centers, those that, that place where I was referring to earlier where you get your cup of coffee, where you've got your bodega at the center of your neighborhood is within a radius that allows you to get within uh, 20 minutes to open space, to parks, certainly to transportation, and within 10 minutes to everything that you might need within your life. This idea of a 20 minute neighborhood is really critical to the success we think of the project. And so this is the reason why we don't just bunch all of the retail or all of the jobs to one end of the project. We actually distribute some of that throughout the project. This way, if you need that cup of sugar on Thanksgiving morning, you're not having to traipse all the way across the city. It's somewhere within a short walk from where you live. Our village centers include also child care facilities, library, other community uses. And at the end of the day, we think if we do this right, we create this matrix, which on the left outlines the goals that you've put in front of us, vibrancy, inclusivity, and equity. So that, those are our goals. And then on the right, how do we ultimately achieve that? So that's our job. How do we deliver on that? And so I won't read through every one of these, but um, for example, we want to have inclusive places and inclusive community. We provide a range of housing types and scales. And so this is our job as your partner. And with that, I think I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Yeah. Why don't you go through the contact? <laughs> All right. Just make it clear. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Excellent presentation. Sorry, your computer got stuck. I was trying to fix it. Hope that wasn't distracting. Uh, on the screen here, uh, for Concord First Partners, we welcome all communication, and we're very responsive to that communication. So please hit us up at our website, issue comments. We'll respond fast. Or you can hit us on the various uh, social media sites that are posted online. And if anybody would like my card at the end of this, I'm certainly happy to hand it out. Thank you very much. We'll turn it to Guy. Great. I also want to point out to you that, because I noticed a number of you taking pictures of the slides, we will have this PowerPoint presentation available on our website uh, tomorrow morning, as well as a link to the video if you want to see this presentation uh, one more time. So now I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, I will bring you the microphone so that we get your question uh, well heard, and then either I'll answer it if I can, or Jeb and the CFP team will answer it uh, if it's more uh, appropriate for them to answer the question. Any questions? I'm, I'll come to you. Thank you. <clears throat> I noticed that in all of the photos of all the different uh, sections of the development, there were no images of any parked vehicles that I could see. Can you tell me how vehicles, as much as this is intended to be a public transit driven space, there will be vehicles, there will be private vehicles. How are those integrated into this plan? So that, uh, thank you very much for that question. I'll let, I'll let Brian answer a little bit of it, but what I, what I want to make sure the, that you're aware of is, is that this isn't the end all be all of the planning process. This term sheet is the beginning of developing the specific plan, of developing uh, the uh, transportation plan, of developing how traffic and parking will work within the project. So some of the uh, answer to your question is we don't know exactly yet. And, and we will be going through a public process uh, and holding meetings and community meetings to discuss how parking, uh, transportation, bike lanes, 
all of the things that we spoke about in the adopted area plan, how we're going to integrate those into the specific plan. So it's an excellent question. We just don't have all the answers yet. I don't know if, Brian, if you wanted to add to that. No, that's, that's great. I, I think I said it. Um, everything's on the table. We'll use a diverse set of strategies to ultimately um, deliver the required parking. And that ranges from in the innovation district where lay down space um, and surface parking may be needed in certain areas, all the way to higher density neighborhoods where um, district parking, like around the TOD core, really begins to make a lot of sense and take cars garages. off the roads. You make parking garages. Now, sorry to interrupt, but the other thing we have to keep in mind, or th the public needs to keep in mind, is the state keeps changing the rules relative to parking. And right now, the legislature is on an anti-parking uh, binge, right? So the city's ability to require parking in certain instances, just like the city's ability to say whether or not you can put a, an accessory dwelling unit in your backyard, is is no longer up to the city right so there is there is some some progressive legislation that is making it uh, more difficult for the city to establish parking minimums and parking requirements and so that will be part of the discussion as we discuss these things in the specific plan process yes um i have a question about the uh, ecological plans. Um, first of all, will the buildings be all electric? I heard somebody say, oh, everything's getting electrified. Does that mean there will be no natural gas fittings in the buildings? That's the first question. Um, the other one is, I see a lot of green in all the pictures, and I love it, you know. Um, but desertification is happening. It's real. It's here. And so, I heard somebody mention recycled water, but what about gray water? Will the buildings be designed so that gray water systems can easily be integrated? Thank you for your questions. Obviously, sustainability is a critical aspect of the project. A lot of the programming to achieve that sustainability, of course, will be born out of the environmental review process and the entitlements and specific plan process to we'll be perfecting and clarifying the sustainable strategies for the project. At this time, I'm not ready to commit to an all electric community, although as Guy alluded to, or as Brian alluded to, I should say, that seems to be the way that California is shifting our resources to de-minimize and eliminate natural gas provisions there is gas service immediately accessible and available to be extended at some cost to the project. And at this time, we're looking to create the variety of utilities, but that doesn't mean we're not open to and looking into an all electric community. Of course, we need to make sure the capacity and all the infrastructure is in place before we commit to an all electric strategy, because there are some, of course, grid updates that are not currently accommodating for such. With regards to the application of gray water, we have done that in a few of our residential communities and working with builder partners. And at this time, certainly we'll consider the request, but again, a little premature for us to make those commitments, but it is a good use of, obviously, the use of water coming from storm and, and reutilizing that back of irrigation. So it's a great strategy, and certainly I, I'm sure it'll be invoked and probably will become a requirement at some point, nonetheless, before so, we get to a planned project. Yes, so, so for, for the city to weigh in, as part of the adopted area plan, uh, the way we uh, are going to treat water or the way water will be used is anything, any external use will be through recycled water. CCWD will, is working with the Central Sanitary, S Sanitation District so that there is enough recycled water for all external uses uh, in the project. Outdoor, yes, sorry. I, st I start talking planner. Uh, yes, all outdoor irrigation uh, will be, if not on day one, as the project evolves and when the project is developed, it will be purple piped so that outdoor water is recycled water, indoor water is drinking water. And then to the extent we get to gray water, that may be further into the process. But that's what we're doing now. Hi, um, I have a question about the affordable housing units. 
Um, and specifically, um, I was hoping you guys could elaborate more about what your agreed upon definition of is of the um, affordability, because I understand that 25% is supposed to be dedicated to people who are below the 80% AMI. Um, but I was wondering if that also if that meant that the rent for those units are going to be matching the income of the renters. For example, 30% of their income only, um, things like that. Yes, we can confirm that the affordable housing program on the site will be suited for 80% or below area median income standards. I'm not sure I know the calculations well enough to understand how to calculate the monthly rent, but obviously rents will be adjusted such that those that can afford at those income levels, the units they live within without taking up their entire income. Okay, and is there a, like a restriction on how, I just, I just read in the term sheet that there was a mention of um, deed restrictions and that it would only last for a minimum of 40 years. I was wondering if that it affected the affordable um, commitment, especially since this is like a 40 year plan. Yeah, when, once the deed restrictions expire, of course, the, the opportunities for market rate rents would be uh, allowed. But again, over, I, I believe it was 55 years if I was incorrect there, but. Um, it was, yeah, it was 55 for rentals, yeah. 45 for owners. Got it, thank you for that clarification. Did we answer your question? Are you sure? That's that's pretty typical of the way affordable uh, housing is financed and restricted. So uh, we're not. We're, that's that's the normal way it's done. Yeah, and and that's why you see in Concord today uh, a number of projects in the Monument and other areas North Concord, where the city has taken. Uh, affordable housing dollars that we have and gone in and bought those because they were expiring and in order to protect those tenants the city or an affordable housing provider with the city's assistance has gone in and bought those units to protect them for another 40 or 50 years okay other questions I'll be I'll be there in just a minute Uh, I have a series of four questions, but I'd be happy to ask them one at a time until another hand goes up. So, um, certainly. So, uh, the staff report specifically identifies that this particular term sheet is slightly different than previous ones. Um, for example, this term sheet includes the entire develop developable area, 2,275 acres, versus lesser areas for the previous developments. Uh, but I suppose I would like to hear some discussion about why, what makes this term sheet special to the residents and the community of Concord, and why should the citizens uh, support and endorse this to uh, the city council? Well, obviously, uh, the opinions are we want to make sure that everyone maintains their own opinion, but certainly our representation of the tremendous community elements and the community benefits are what we hope brings this community together to support the project, including the delivery of permanent and temporary jobs in a robust fashion with prioritized to local Concord. It's a project that is a piece of land, vacant land, that's really not doing anybody any good right now. And to us, it's an eyesore, and it's been too long. And why the term sheet is so important and why the term sheet, in this case, is so special is we've devised a program that will allow the project to proceed forth. And you know, talking about the project is great, but we actually want to be building the project. And we think, and obviously, in building the project, that's where the benefits to the community really lie. So uh, in our minds, we've developed a term sheet in close coordination and negotiation with the city that will allow this project to proceed forth as it sits today. Um, so I, I think that's, that's really the program. And I mean, the community benefit elements, the contributions towards special facilities that are above and beyond the existing policy are embracing all of the, the communication, the community outreach, all the terms, the higher than typical affordable housing, commitments to working with labor, all things we fully support and embrace uh, are why this project and why this term sheet is so special and why they also differ from prior term sheets. And the coverage of the entire property, 
you know, prior developers have attacked this different ways in smaller increments. We believe it's important to really comprehensively plan the project at once, although we won't be buying their, or taking down the property at once. Like I said earlier, we'll be closing or transferring property in phases, so it'll be orderly, of course, in that regard. But we do believe that planning for the whole to make sure we incorporate that full balance of mixed land uses is so critical. I hope that answers that first question. Yeah, just to tack on to that. So yes, the distinction between this term sheet and the previous Lennar term sheet is the fact that Lennar, and at the time the city's thinking was designed around a small initial first phase with the concept that if everyone performed well, that they could continue on. The issue with that smaller term sheet in that smaller phase is it stopped us from considering the whole project as part of the term sheet. This term sheet allows us to look at the entire 40 years, the entire project, and plan uh, all of the aspects of it better. Remember, the term sheet is the initial framework that we will then turn into a actual specific plan to implement. So uh, I think it's a good term sheet, uh, and, but it does have a distinction from what the community understood uh, six years ago. So I appreciate the question. There's another question back here. Now. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that I'm putting myself in uh, a risky situation by speaking out because I know what happened to Cora, and I know that Cora was intimidated and she was put in a position where she felt unsafe by speaking out. And uh, we shouldn't be dealing with developers that make people feel unsafe. I mean, that should be from the get-go when one of our members of the community was intimidated and put under threat to stop talking, to stop criticizing, this should have been canceled immediately. And the fact that this just keeps going forward is pretty shocking. Uh, I don't scare easy. I know people who know people. And I get things done. Well, now I'm moving on to my question. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's your problem, not mine. So affordability seems to be in question because there's an immediate acknowledgement that the housing is going to be so expensive that on phase one, there needs to be a food bank. So the housing isn't affordable because they're going to put all the people are going to put all their money to the housing that they have to go to a food bank to eat. That's not right. That's not affordable housing. Uh, number two, the water issue. So the Coyote Springs project that the Sinos are working on is still stalled because of water disputes, trying to tap into water that it didn't have the right to. So is that gonna happen here? Most likely, there's gonna be water disputes which stall this project quite some time. Uh, Tagami, he's in legal disputes with the city of Oakland. Is he gonna be in legal disputes with the city of Concord? Most likely, yes. That's, just, that's the way it's gonna be, unfortunately. There's no guarantees that you can offer right now that that's not going to be the case. And as for the history of environmental degradation, I would recommend that observers from Earth First be present and involved. And uh, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you. The guy, uh, I don't mind responding bank, to that guy. No, no. Uh, so the food bank is in the phase it's in because the city asked uh, and we will coordinate with the food bank to determine when they need the expansion and how that expansion might play out in the specific plan. So uh, there's no implicit, because we're putting a food bank in a particular phase, we expect that phase to be any more expensive than any other phase in the project. There's no correlation. Uh, we are attempting, as part of a legally binding agreement that the city made with the federal government, to provide space to the food bank for both the provision of food throughout the region and for job training for people who need to be trained in how to uh, do logistics and those sorts of things. The issue of water, 
I, I'm just answering your statements. You didn't really make questions, but you, the, on the issue of water, the Contra Costa Water District has twice, both 10 years ago and about a year and a half ago, issued a will serve letter. They have the water to provide the water for this development, especially in light of the fact that we are making an effort and are committed to, to providing our outdoor water uh, as recycled water. And so water is not an issue for this project at this time, according to the water district. And whether or not you like one of the developers or not, that's your absolute right and you should communicate to council about that. But that's not an issue of the term sheet. And I would suggest that this term sheet is a good term sheet regardless of who the developer is. Questions? Yes. Hi, Gloria. Thank you, Guy. Uh, hi, Deb. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, lots to absorb here, so appreciate that you gave us the visuals along with the text yesterday. A couple quick things, because affordable housing has come up. You know I'm going to ask about it. We'll have more chances to talk. But I appreciate that there is a, uh, there is a, a, an acknowledgment of jobs housing balance um, in the plan. Um, I'd be curious how you all are thinking about jobs housing fit, as in do the, the income levels of the jobs created match the income levels of the homes that are going to be built, right? So that's really important. And to that end, I think it may be helpful for the room here to have a better understanding of the junior ADU concept because it's it's different than a regular ADU and without having a visual of it or sort of who lives there might be hard for people to understand. So if you could elaborate a little bit on what a JADU is. And then finally, just if you would be able to explain a little bit more why the TOD is not emphasized in the first phase, because that is something that I think is probably going to be a concern for us. So thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for your questions. It's, it was, of course, is premature to be attempting to dictate the type of employment. I know you're bored of this question in my answer to it. Nonetheless, there's going to be such a robust job center. We, I mean, all I can say today, Gloria, is that we see a variety of job opportunities coming with a variety. There's not one single select type of business that we're promoting or boxing in. We're promoting full flexibility within the job center and the innovation district, and likely jobs coming out of the campus district as well. But obviously, we understand the question with regards to making sure that the jobs being produced on the base support and require folks of all income levels on the base to work with on those. And at this point in time, again, premature to really for us to decide in five, six, seven years what those job type users will be. But we do see such a robust diversity, and we're incorporating that diversity, in, and we will in the specific plan process. There's enough to go around, and so we believe a diverse job production will happen, not only for the construction during the project, but also, of course, for permanent Plus, we're going to have a lot of retail and commercial opportunities and more service jobs in that light. So certainly within the retail portions as well, it'll come throughout the project. There will be further job opportunities. But again, within the innovation district, where we envision light manufacturing, heavy manufacturing, those land uses themselves should dictate and generate a high diverse range of job types. The junior accessory dwelling unit clarification. So a, a junior accessory dwelling unit, I should, I'll have my builder partner explain this, but it's an attached unit that's built as a part of a single family residence, of course. So when we think about a junior accessory dwelling unit in a three-story detached single family house, the JADU would likely make up almost the entirety of the bottom floor of a house, in addition likely to the garage, of course, which will be on every house. And that'll have a separate and detached entrance such that you really can rent it out and have two separate, like I said, two separate entrances such that whomever you're renting through under, under that deed restriction at 80% or below for that JADU, it's, like I said, a, an accessible one-bedroom studio that doesn't involve someone being forced through your residence or having someone actually live in your house together. So that's really what the JADU, we envision a bedroom, probably a kitchenette of some sort, and a bathroom. Is, is how we envision what that'll be. So it's very, again, similar to a studio apartment environment. Uh, and then the transit-oriented district, the nature of the infrastructure really dictates the phasing. 
And we, you know, with the water tanks that need to be built for the reservoirs for both recycled and domestic water, and the entry into the project for the sewer, as well as our electric and gas utilities, and our focus to deliver Willow Pass Road with the initial phase of development are all driving forces for a specific phasing program. And we are also extremely confident in the phase one uses and know those can be immediately deliverable. And it's very critical because they need to help finance the four to $500 million of infrastructure that will be required to activate any development on this property. And just by the nature of the infrastructure phasing, that the plan looks small on paper, it's a gigantic area as we all know, and extending that infrastructure and utilities in the initial phase to the TOD, look, our prerogative is to generate an act, uh, the TOD as soon as possible. We understand it's the heart of the plan. We understand the vibrancy, the economic opportunities, the access to transit, but it has to be done under a financial feasible framework, and that's really what's dictating this, the infrastructure, not our desire to activate one specific area versus another. Did answer your question, Glory? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm curious if I, I realize I'm going to ask you to speculate, but given all the process elements that unfold as have been described tonight, including the term sheet, what is your best guess today for the date that a union worker under a PLA will walk onto the job site with a job, and in what numbers? And what numbers is going to be very difficult me, for me to ascertain. Um, that will take some calculation. Certainly our commitment to working with the building trades extends to our horizontal infrastructure, which will of course precede the vertical infrastructure. Right now we've outlined a two-year process to secure the entitlements as Guy Bierke, excuse me, Guy described, uh, to get us to a point where we can actually start implementing the design of infrastructure drawings. And once we design the infrastructure drawings, which I surmise will take a year after our entitlements, I would suggest that breaking ground effectively, you're asking me to speculate here, without a commitment is in approximately four to five years of when a first union worker would be actively constructing our horizontal infrastructure for the property. We imagine that horizontal infrastructure, the backbone infrastructure, take, taking, of course, it'll be incrementally in phases, probably a year and a half to two years to deliver before vertical construction is likely to ensue on the property. That's my best guess today. We have not, of course, uh, and he codified those timelines, but we're going to obviously expedite the delivery of the site as much as possible. I see you have your hand up, sir. Hey, hang on, hang on, guy's going to come run to you, or walk slowly. That that is that that is what we believe is is. I mean, I don't think there'll be any interim uses in the time frame. Yeah. There could be an interim use. And if, if there is, then that'll be, of course, coordinated with our, 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 our labor groups. But nonetheless, um, for the actual project development as, as we've presented today, I imagine it is in that timeline. So, of Greg, the, the master developer is being very conservative. And I would, my answer to that question would be uh, three years. And three years is because uh, uh, that assumes that we don't get sued. If we get sued or somebody challenges the entitlements, then I think Jeb's absolutely correct. If we are not sued and we're able to move expeditiously, uh, I, think we, I think it's three years. But whether it's three or four years, all of the initial work uh, horizontally for the, you know, the, the laborers, the operating engineers, all of the horizontal infrastructure work is 100% uh, union work. So it do, the first two or three years is 100% union, and of course, under the PLA, once we get to vertical, all of that is 100% union. So uh, I think in the scheme of things, uh, w we probably have a difference of opinion on timing, but, uh, but we'll get there. Other questions? If we, can, if we can do it in three oh, years, we'll do it in three years. I know, I know. I'm just, I just, you guys are so conservative. Okay, Rick. Uh, it, it seems clear to me that uh, phase one is called the back infrastructure backbone, also referred to as the horizontal construction. It seems clear that you know CRP will finance uh, and construct the infrastructure that's necessary to and, and critical for 
getting a strong start and laying the backbone for the rest of the phases. But at the, at the end of the day, if you will, that infrastructure, it is my belief, will be dedicated back to the city. Uh, from the long-term maintenance perspective, how does that work? Will the transfer of the infrastructure indeed be a dedication back to the city for the city to maintain, or is there some element of this term sheet that includes, as it's written in the term sheet as I understand it, a long-term maintenance component? Thank you for the question. Obviously, our presence here as the master developer is to do exactly that, to fund or secure financing to implement the backbone infrastructure to activate the development of the site. So uh, we're here for many reasons, but that is one of the keynote reasons is we, are the finan we have the financial capacity, of course, to execute upon that, and that's what will be required. We're certainly going to, it's going to be our responsibility to make sure the financing is secured for that infrastructure. And again, before any land is conveyed, we must confirm with the city that we have the financial, the financing already secured in position identified to actually build that infrastructure, even to the tune of the several hundred million dollars I've represented. Uh, yes, all the backbone infrastructure on the site is meant to be public infrastructure. So the process is typically where we would go build the infrastructure, the city would inspect to make sure we built it per the plans, then they would likely give us a few corrections, but nonetheless, we'll clean that up, and then the city would accept that infrastructure for maintenance. Of course, we'll be paying fees for the development that will go towards that. Uh, we are coordinating and negotiating with the city certain assessment districts for maintenance, but typically these are handled through permit fees and, uh, and of course, the taxes people pay around. So, um, yes, all the infrastructure on the property is going to be back, put back in the city's hands. We're not proposing any private backbone infrastructure at all on the property. Now, there may be some higher density communities that have I won't say gated, but maybe their HOA and some private streets, but we're talking about the internal subdivision streets for small branches of communities. I'm just offering the flexibility there if that happens. But again, to answer your question, all public infrastructure that we finance and build will be turned back to the city of Concord. And, and Rick, you as a city engineer will help us devise a way to make sure that we can maintain it over the life of the project and we'll build that into the project. So it's a... a the maintenance part of the question was probably the curveball Rick was was thrown out. Now that I know he's a city engineer, yeah, I understand that's that. That's great. Uh, Addie. In one of your PowerPoints, you talked a lot about transparency, being an open book with your budgets and revenues. But I'm not seeing right now, which has been a question since the beginning, since we've been entertaining Concord First Partners as an ally in this development, where is the money coming from? Um, I'm not seeing in the phases, for example, how that infrastructure will be built. How much is each partner bringing to the table? When you did that beautiful map of each phase, I'd like to see in the next meeting, you know, um, how much that phase is gonna cost, how much of that money is secured now, who's paying for it, and how much is it gonna be reliant on the city to come up for and how much is it you know coming from more taxes you know I mean it's just like it's not very clear or it hasn't been very clear how much money you as a partners already have to start on this project because there's been no transparency on that um, are you going to be relying on CFDs you know that kind of questions is is what we like to see I think that I'm bouncing off a little bit on previous questions, but I'm really asking for numbers. Where are they? Th thank you very much. It's, we are projecting the financial aspects of this project right now based upon conceptual land uses. The specific plan process will finalize the land plan and will dictate all of the infrastructure that will be required on a phase-by-phase -phase basis. So. The reason why we can't articulate to you the exact cost of these facilities is simply because that work has not been completed yet. Today we've an anticipated as much as we can based upon the level of planning, costs and cost components that the city and their financial teams have fully vetted and reviewed based upon a con conceptual drawing with very robust contingencies embedded in case there are changes as the plan evolves down the road. So. 
when we talk about transparency, typically in public-private partnerships, the entire financials do need to be kept confidential. Confidential between the city and the developer, the city, again, will have full access under confidentiality, of course, to review all of our books and records to validate and ensure that we not only have the financial capacity to execute, but also reviewing all the costs and revenues that will be born again through the shared success program, the profit participation program. Our companies collectively build hundreds of millions of infrastructure on an annual basis in master plan projects. The proof is there. Uh, we finance that out of pocket. Sometimes we secure development loans. In this case, we're gonna likely do the same thing. We absolutely will be implementing a community facility district on this property to help finance improvements and offer some maintenance in the long term. And the most important aspect to one of your questions is the absolute commitment that the city will be fiscally neutral out of this site, such that the city will not subsidize, come out of pocket, or make any direct contributions to the project now or in the future. So that's a backbone pillar of all the negotiations that we've had to date. And I think as the entitlements come together and our, we have financial plans that'll be developed and we have already done some preliminary financial planning that does reflect the situation where this will be a fiscally positive project to the city, not a subsidy situation from the city's perspective. Um, so in any case, um, the transparency is there. I, not, I open book is, is with every public-private partnership, so we are definitely adhering to the accountability and transparency provisions that the city and this community is expected in my mind. Yeah, just to tag on for a, a moment, we, uh, the city's position has been from the very beginning that this project had to pay for itself, that the existing residents and existing community should not be asked to subsidize it. And, and we're, we're staying true to that. Uh, when we talk about CFDs, it would be CFDs that residents in the project pay to support the project, right? It's not a CFD that would come out into your neighborhood or Tim's neighborhood or anywhere else, right? So, so we're maintaining that. And then, and then secondarily, um, when, we, when we get to a point where we uh, have regular reviews uh, in, a, in an annual way, we will make those annual reports available to the community and to the council so that they can see how the project is progressing what what is happening in the project so there will be a level of transparency as to how the the monies are flowing through where they're flowing through from and how they're being used and we'll be doing that on on an annual basis as part of our open book accounting and, and just to pile on one more time on that again in order for any property to transfer yeah. we must put the property in a development ready condition and prove to the city that we have the financial capacity to execute upon that particular phase of infrastructure before any property is conveyed. So we'll have to prove the financial capacity on a phase-by-phase -phase basis throughout the project, held accountable throughout the project. Yeah, if you, if you get into the term sheet under the land transfer section, it talks about the various steps that Concord First Partners as master developer will have to do in order to prove to the city it has the resources and the ability to take the next step in the project. And so that is an issue uh, that was brought up six years ago with Lennar's term sheet. Uh, we have understood that the community uh, supports that uh, and we've made sure it's in this term sheet. But I understand the concern and the questions and you should continue to raise them. And, and just to respond to one of the other questions I don't think we answered is the infrastructure programming. And in the back of the term sheet is one of the exhibits. There's a general outline on a phase-by-phase -phase basis of what infrastructure components we are suggesting will be implemented. Again, it's conceptual, high level, but nonetheless, it will reflect the infrastructure commitments we're making on a phase-by-phase -phase basis from a scope perspective. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Tim. Uh, okay, uh, two questions. Um, first off, you mentioned water tanks. Okay, and I'd love to know where those things are going. Uh, second, you mentioned AWCFS, autom Automated Waste Collection System. Uh, I have no idea what that is. It sounds cool. What is it? 
I'll have Brian answer the second one. Um, the project has already prescribed infrastructure scope that requires water storage and recycled water storage as part of the project, and that's for backup facilities also to allow water to churn back through pump systems in order to offer adequate fire protection. The water tanks have not been formally sited yet, so that'll be again developed during the infrastructure planning, but we are going well, to be working with the East Bay Regional Parks District is there are already identified general bubble areas that are within the PVC property of where those tanks would go, which we would run lines through, up, and back to yeah. serve the project. Guy, go ahead. So, so Tim, uh, when the park district was transferred property from the Navy to the Interior Department, ultimately to the regional park, um, they carved out about 300 acres slightly east of Willow Pass Road at the right elevation, the water district chose the elevation, and the water district is now looking at those 300 acres to tell us where the best location for the water tanks and reservoirs for both recycled and drinking water should be. And so that's part of the specific planning process, but it will be in the hill uh, above the project, about 300, in the within the regional park area yes and the and will be piped down into the development and how that how those tanks are blended into the hillside and all of that is still to be discussed in the specific plan uh, because obviously we don't want them to be an eyesore so it, it's that's been programmed out the second question yeah. yeah, so Tim, on the smart city piece, um, you know, at the scale of the weapon station, it allows us to actually think about infrastructure that has a sensing technology, and it's becoming very commonplace and much more affordable. So in this one example, um, instead, of our, um, instead of our city workers going around looking for where are refuse cans or dumpsters or whatever it might be, increasingly this, th these, these devices, they actually let us know when they are full, so on demand they can go out and empty um, waste canisters and other things. This this goes on to automated parking. This goes on to traffic signals that can communicate congestion. So we think there's an ability to create smart city data um, that starts with waste and, and builds from there so that um, we're just a more efficient place. Other questions? Let me get one more and then I'll come back. Uh, there's a common belief in the community that there is remediation of residual column waste products from the Navy's operation that needs to be uh, coordinated uh, and paid for by and with the Navy. I'm curious to understand how that will be, how, how has that planning and the coordination of that remediation to the satisfaction of all the guidance documents and the federal government standards been accounted for and rolled into this term sheet and any risks that you see that are sort of red flags at this point? Probably gonna have a joint answer on this one. Um, the cr now that I know you're city engineer, I'll be more precise in my answers as well. Oh, a, I, sorry, a engineer in the city. Um, that being said, the Navy is absolutely responsible for the remediation of the site, and they're responsible for the remediation site per the prior 2012 CRP area plan, which we have stayed materially consistent with, such that the remediation that was set to occur within specific land use areas should still adequately serve remediation standards for our revised site plan that we're proposing. So that is absolutely keynote. The good news is the Navy has already made tremendous progress on remediating the site, having already released for transfer over a thousand acres, which really make up the bulk of our first two phases of development. Now, obviously we'll be going through due diligence and we'll be looking at all those things to ensure that remediation has occurred, both with the city and ourselves. We're equally concerned about that, uh, of course, but. And these will be further understood, of course, during our EDC conveyance agreement negotiations. But again, the good news is there's outline, there's weekly or monthly meetings where the Navy is articulating to, to environmentalists and, and groups that are interested, their progress and their status that's set to occur. Again, their timeline is actually going to, right now, the timeline they're suggesting does go in flow with our development. In fact, they should be 
ahead of us, which is wonderful, uh, but nonetheless, we're here to make darn sure that all that remediation does occur to the project satisfaction so there's no uh, restrictions placed upon the property accordingly, assuming again that we provide the land uses consistent with the area plan in those locations. Guy, do you want to expand on that? No, you, you did a pretty good job there. So, uh, but I'll just say two things. One, uh, w the city has been working with the Navy uh, on a regular basis for almost 15 years now, maybe slightly longer. And there are monthly uh, remedial program manager meetings in which the Navy's team is uh, doing over the shoulder uh, reviews by EPA, uh, the Department of Toxic Substance Control, which is Cal EPA, uh, the Water Board, the Air Board, uh, name a board. They're all in the room uh, discussing what's being done, what's the Navy proposing to do. We have a very solid understanding with the Navy that they will not transfer anything to the city until it has achieved uh, a level of cleanliness that matches our area plan document. And they made that commitment in their uh, EIR for EIS, Environmental Impact Statement for transfer. So. Yes, we have to monitor it. Yes, we take it very seriously. But so far, the first 1,200 acres is good and ready to go, and we can effectively begin this development. And by the time we need to get into uh, phase three or phase four, Bunker City will come later as it is cleaned up from the arsenic. And so we will have momentum by the time those properties are cleaned and ready to be transferred to the city and for the city to transfer them to, to the master developer. Eddie. I may have two or three questions. I'm not really sure how they're gonna break up yet. But um, in one of your slides, you talked about um, wanting there to be diverse retail, diverse um, business owners um, to also um, be part of the diverse community you wanna see, right? But. I've seen in Concord now that it's really hard to even keep our diverse um, food restaurants because they can't afford the leases here. And that's made our downtown become a little gentrified. And we worry about the gentrification even of the monument. And I don't want to see an east-west Palo Alto come out of this project, so I don't know how you plan to connect how can some of these community benefits also ensure that a different side of Concord is gonna look as great and feel for them because they don't get to live on this new world-class project, which for me, I would prefer a community-based project, not a world-class, because I really don't care what's happening somewhere else. I, wanna, I care what's happening here. So I know that's like, there's three things in that big, long comment question about how do we ensure, how are you ensuring that the small businesses are gonna be able to afford? How can we ensure our Thai restaurants don't get pushed out of the community? Our uh, Mexican restaurants, our black owned restaurants, our indigenous uh, owned restaurants. Um, Guy Bjorka, you mentioned previously, different question, that um, some of the indigenous landmarks were identified and somehow um, at the library somewhere. But we, I haven't had heard discussions anywhere in this presentation around how we're inviting the Bay Miwok uh, families and community or the Ohlone tribes to be part of this process to ensure that we are going to be mindful of where their landmarks are, their ceremonial or families. How are we gonna incorporate them into these communities? Because they are part of the diversity and um, so I'd like to see how they are gonna be built into this. Um, and lastly, a different type of question, because I'm part of the by Concord community, I know that we wanna see wider streets so that we can ensure that we have protected bike lanes. A lot of the bike lanes there look pretty because they're nice and greenly painted, but those aren't safe bike lanes. Anybody could still hit us. Drunk drivers can still hit us when we're riding our bikes. We need separated protected bike lanes, bike lanes that are closer to sidewalks where the car's on the other side. Um, but if the streets aren't wide enough to begin with, then you can't plan for that. You know, even my, on my street on 
Anne, uh, um, Anne and uh, uh, Solano Grant Street. The city couldn't promise us protected bike lanes because the streets weren't wide enough. So how can you ensure that, that it's gonna allow people in their communities to bike safely and get to trails or the business community? Thank you again for your great answers. I, I'll try to work backwards and then I'll be reminded and I'm not gonna handle the, the one question. I'll handle the one question lightly, but I'll turn that one to Guy. So as Brian explained as part of our planning process, what we've done and, and are very focused on, what, first of all, our company and collectively our partnership are very focused on a healthy and active lifestyle being promoted throughout the community. So there will be absolutely robust walking and biking trails throughout the project, but as Brian explained, what we're also seeking to do is detach those movements away from where automobiles are altogether. As he alluded to in our central greenway connecting the very southern tip of the project all the way to the BART station, the important TOD district, throughout the project, we're hoping to minimize the interaction of pedestrians and bi people on bicycles, bicyclists, uh, from interacting with cars. Uh, certainly there's gonna be a street crossing or, or two. That's, we have to do that just for transportation safety network buildability of the site, but our, our focus is to detach these trail systems in exactly the manner you're speaking of, not only to separate them from the streets, but to separate them entirely from the corridor altogether. So obviously, again, that'll be born through the specific plan process and refined, and that's where you'll see the details focused upon that. But we have that, we share that same concept with you to detach and make sure a safe environment is certainly there. Yeah. On the, so, oh, please, Guy. Yeah, let me take over. Go ahead. That. Okay. So, so in terms of bike lanes and bike facilities, as Jeb just alluded to, that is a specific plan process where, and there was a commitment. So, so in the next two years, we will have community discussions about that and we will work those into the program as appropriate, right? So there is a commitment to those types of protected bike facilities. Relative to the, the Native American reference, so, we have, because we've been planning this project so long, had multiple uh, consultations with the tribes and the affected tribes. And there are two uh, uh, spots that are significant to the, to the tribes. They have both been protected. We are in, the city is already in, a memorandum of understanding uh, with the State Historic Preservation Office for how we deal with ours. The Park District has one on their parcel. And I'm sure we will consult further with the tribes as, the, as those sites are protected. But we have a commitment to the state to protect those sites. Um, your concern about uh, diversity and the economy, that's a great concern. I'm concerned about it too. I'm not just concerned about how that might play out on the base. I too am concerned about how it plays out in our existing community. And there's only so much that this development project can do to uh, dictate the marketplace, right? In other words, if saving the diversity of restaurants is a function of rent, uh, we need to be careful that we don't make the project no longer pencil, right? And it's not just a project issue, it might be a region-wide issue. And so I think we all need to have that discussion. How do we protect diverse uh, restaurants? How do we protect uh, different types of businesses uh, while at the same time uh, not uh, injuring uh, the property owners, the, the landlords, and, and the people that we need to bring to the table to have a bigger discussion about how we maintain the economic viability of Concord overall. So, if, I, if I may, Guy, real quick answer the one last part. You answered the, the, the ones that were great. The, the the item associated with a community-based plan in the conflict that you've identified with a world-class community. Well, a world-class community was not defined by us, it was defined by this community. And the leading theme of the world-class portion and how that's defined is supporting equity and inclusion in this project. It's highlighted in the area plan, it's highlighted in all the planning documents accordingly. So. We don't want to get the world-class definition to be lost, and I would refer everyone certainly back to book one in the area plan that's online on the city's website. And I, I would guide everyone to look at the overarching goals, themes, and the city's definition 
with the community of what makes a world-class project in Concord, and it is very much a community-based plan. You saw things that seamlessly integrate with Concord in our visions. You didn't see high-rise buildings out of San Francisco or things that don't work for Concord. I mean, our focus is to seamlessly integrate this project with Concord, but also not rely upon Concord to help pay for it, as we discussed earlier. So just want to make sure that, that the, the definition of world-class is very much a community-based plan. And again, I refer back to area, uh, book one of the area plan. Okay, maybe one or two more questions. Here we go. Good evening. Does your plan account for speed limits, uh, like maximum speed limits, especially in the parts of the, the project that are furthest away from the freeway? And the second part related to traffic is, as someone who commutes 242 quite often in the mornings, does this plan account for um, you know, the congestion points at Clayton and Concord? Because the last thing I would like to see is um, the only other option to get out of this community for new neighbors is a street like Clayton or uh, Concord Avenue with stoplight after stoplight that gets really jam-packed at certain times of the day. So I, I'd like to see thoroughfares. Thank, thank you so much for that question. I, I, I may ask, I may, answer that question with a question to you on speed limits to understand exact, I assume you're concerned about the high speed or are you concerned about not going fast enough? I'm not going fast. Aha, my kind of guy, I like that. So uh, this is going to be a, a non-answer for your question and the reason why is because this is all part of the specific plan and the environmental review process that will dictate the size, the capacity, the network of our street systems. At that time, we'll be certainly imputing very important safety standards for these roadways, but Willow Pass Road is, you know, I do it during peak hours most time as I transit in and out of this, this area. And that being said, we recognize that we need quick access to the freeway, but we don't want to necessarily open up access throughout the city. But with regards to the environmental analysis, it's not just going to look at the project, it's going to look at the regional system throughout the city of Concord. And there will be contributions towards offsite improvements within the city that are off the space to help relieve those traffic conditions. And that's the, that, but that'll, unfortunately, I can't answer it today because that'll happen during the environmental review process, yes. Just, just a quick follow-up, because I wanted to just give the perspective for our neighbors in Clayton and how long it might take them to get out to the freeway and to their respective jobs. It actually quite affects the home value and the type of businesses that can move there. For transient workers that don't live in the neighborhood, it makes it even more difficult to, to work there, so. Thank you. And of course, transit is also going to be an important aspect of the project as well. So we give alternatives to just driving it within the project to make sure the same systems that are going through. But again, a lot of these questions, are, and please come back during the project um, so, setting. So when we were, when, when we were working with Lennar, uh, we had gotten fairly far along in the specific plan and the creation of some roadway networks to be studied. So I, I'm sure as we move into this new specific plan, we will do likewise. But please understand, the uh, Highway 4 segment uh, will be widened with a lane in each direction as part of an already approved Caltrans project. Uh, there will also be additional frontage roads, so a frontage road that would connect Evora from Willow Pass Road to Port Chicago. And then in order not to make the golfers mad, we'll have to fix the golf course because it's going to screw up holes six and seven pretty badly, right? So, and then below Highway 4, there'll be another frontage road that comes from Willow Pass over to the BART station in Port Chicago. There will also, because I know Tim is very concerned about this, and rightly so, there will be additional connectors with Salvio and the way panoramic comes down to try and relieve some of the existing traffic on Oliveira and Port Chicago Highway. So people have a new way to get to the North Concord BART station that they don't have today. Not all of that is gonna happen on day one, but it is all thought into the project as we move forward. So before, uh, I want to make sure we, if there's any other questions, I want to kind of wrap up. I do want to introduce Council Member Bersan, who has joined us to listen in tonight, and I want to thank you for joining us. Um, and if there aren't any additional questions, we said we'd run this from six to eight. It's 
It's just a little bit after eight. Again, we will be here doing something very similar to this, if not identical to it, uh, two weeks from tonight on December 15th. So I apologize if you're a Niners fan, uh, but you know, uh, there's only so many weeks in December. But uh, at any rate, if you wanna come back, if you have questions, uh, you can ask us or you can send us emails. Again, as you have opinions, um, you need to communicate that with the city council because they will be making th this decision on January 7th or at least considering this issue on January 7th. But if you have questions, go to the website, let us know, we'll try and get you answers. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming out tonight. I wanna thank our translator uh, who's done a great job this evening. Uh, and we will see you either on the 15th or on January 7th. Thank you very much.